Okay, testing one, two, three. Alrighty, it looks like I'm live. Um, so for those of you just tuning in, hello, I'm Matthew Krupsack, uh, the coder of the Open Athena project. Um, I have something that I've been thinking about uh, since about 2020 is when I first created this project. Um, but in the past couple of um, months, week, days, um, I've been thinking about it more and more just because of the impact of the idea and actually seeing it in use in the real world. Um, so this is Open Athena. This is, um, I think, the best way to show just the basic premises with a picture. Um, so multi-copter, rotary wing, uh, aircraft, like little drones or whatever for consumer use. You've probably seen them a million times if you dork with the technology, but the basic premise is you have a, a consumer available, just cheap rotary wing aircraft platform. Um, you have two sets of opposing rotors and the two spin different directions to balance out the torque. Um, and, you know, they generate enough lift for a small aircraft. Um, they're extremely stable, uh, easy to fly, and uh, they can get pretty good first-person vision from their uh, downward-facing camera, which I'll go into more later. Um, but kind of an under underappreciated aspect of that kind of aircraft platform is that they're extremely cheap and they're extremely easy to replace uh, and extremely easy to acquire for um, anything from regular armies to insurgent forces. And now um, I've observed in the past, really the only weaponization of these kind of consumer platforms has been with like improvised explosives where they fly the physical thing up to somebody. But then you lose the drone and it's kind of a waste and you might not even do what you were aiming to do, those kind of like one-way drone delivery. Um, there already exists a much better much more tested way of delivering explosives to a target. Um, it's artillery, or otherwise called precision indirect fires. Um, you know, artillery kind of gets forgotten about because really it hasn't been um, as important since the age of combined arms warfare in World War II. But you got to remember in World War I, um, the prominence of artillery just completely created a stalemate environment. And it was only when we had motor vehicles where people were moving faster to get out of the way of artillery where um, people started to kind of forget about it and not think about it as much. Um, but there's the quote attributed to Napoleon, uh, God is on the side with the most artillery. Um, that is not a empty quote. And in fact, if we actually look at the data from uh, World War II, there's actually a very interesting study that was done on the causative agents of casualties. And let me see if I can pull that up. Yeah, so in World War II, they did a study um, in the two major theaters, the Pacific and the European, or sorry, South Pacific and North Africa. Um, and they found that shell fragments were up to 75% of the wounds that they were, they were able to record. And so you would think in a conventional war, it's the tanks, it's the infantry, it's the planes, you know, blah, 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 that are causing injuries and having that effect on the front line. Uh, but the data doesn't bear that out. The data actually so shows, by and large, um, indirect fire, artillery, um, has a much more damaging effect just because, I mean, we don't really think about it, but an artillery shell is generating shrapnel everywhere. That's why everybody in a combat theater has to wear a helmet at all times. It's because, you know, that shrapnel just goes everywhere and it's devastating if it's in the right spot. Um, so kind of going back to the premise of this project, going back to the image of the concept diagram. Um, so the basic premise is you have a quadricopter rotary wing consumer aircraft. Um, it typically has on board a um, magnetic field sensor for determining... Uh, direction like compass heading. Um, it has, of course, the four rotors keeping it level. It has an accelerometer which measures tilt. Um, and they generally stay pretty level. And then it should have a camera that the remote operator can view with their remote control. Um, and then that camera can be either level with the horizon 
or aimed downwards a certain um, amount, a certain angle. And so the basic premise with this is you might be able to see something directly in your middle of your vision if you're looking through a FPV drone, uh, but you don't know where that point on the ground is. You only know the point where your drone is because the drone has a GPS on board and it has a barometric sensor for determining air pressure for altitude. So you may know where your drone is, but you don't know where the thing that you're looking at is. Um, and that can be really difficult if you're using one of these consumer aircraft to try to direct indirect fire. Um, and so that actually can introduce some error and it actually has a pretty big risk of miscalculation, misjudgment that can end up being devastating for civilians or um, friendly fire incidents. So basically the premise of this project is that it is possible using terrain data and a mathematically constructed line emitted from the center of the aircraft camera's view frustum. Um, and where those two kind of intersect, the point of the closest intersection, is more likely than not what the target, what the camera is aiming at. And so that allows these, um, these aircraft to be much further out of harm's way, where they don't have to be directly over the thing they want to know the location of. But they can still get a accurate enough positional resolution in very uh, rapid time. Um, which more and more, I've, I've been following all kinds of news of this Ukraine stuff. Um, and it really is the case where they're finding that for traditional combined arms warfare, um, this, this kind of artillery observation is hugely disruptive to established norms and doctrine. Um, so I just want to show a couple of videos I've seen real quick. Yeah, and we've even seen this for like tank armored battalions and stuff like that. Just the artillery, if it's hitting them dead on, you know, it stops them in their tracks. And um, more and more reports are coming out that a lot of artillery is being observed with uh, these rotary wing consumer aircraft platforms. And let me, I have on the GitHub, I have a couple more examples. Um, this Twitter account is really good. So here's an example of a Russian artillery battery starting to set up and they're being uh, forward observed for counter battery fire by a consumer drone. Now I'm guessing that the operator of this consumer rotary wing aircraft, you know, had to do some guesswork and maybe see where that road was and kind of estimate it a little bit and then phone it in where these rounds are landing as the artillery crew is working. Um, but, you know, this is a direct example. They haven't even set up the battery yet, and they're already taking accurate counter-battery fire, um, which is extremely disruptive to existing conventional combined arms doctrine. Uh, probably another interesting example. Um, yeah, they've, they've even had examples where... Um, so this is just kind of a minor one. They're correcting rounds as they land and helping them land more on target until we see some pretty interesting fireworks. Yeah, and, and so they were landing a little bit long originally, but then the aircraft operator helped the indirect fire team to adjust, and that's pretty disruptive. That's pretty scary. Um, and it, it really poses a uh, real risk to existing combined arms doctrine. Uh, yeah, and here we see a tank convoy being artillery observed by another one of these consumer rotary wing aircraft. And it stops the convoy 
in the middle of the road. They were about to go into a dense urban center, and they couldn't even make it down the road. They were getting extremely accurate. Um, I think in this case, this is small caliber mortar. Um, you know, maybe crew served just by a couple of infantrymen. Um, but they can't even see the thing, and they're hitting it dead on. Um, and I think it's this kind of effect of accurate, rapid, precision, and direct fire that has really kind of only became possible with the ubiquity of um, inexpensive consumer electronics and their various sensors. Um, and it really, it's, it's dis disruptive for existing combined arms doctrine. Um, and then this was even an example where you know, Ukraine was, their artillery teams were firing on all cylinders here. Um, they were able to hit the roof of a storage facility with some artillery shells and then have rockets land in and destroy all the vehicles inside after the roof was already blown up. Um, so they had planned kind of like a one-two punch. Um, and then here they are observing it. Um, I can't tell if this is a fixed-wing platform or a rotary wing. Um... But, you know, again, it's this artillery observation is really key to understanding the nature of targets, the movement of targets in real time, and how to make sure those rounds land in the right place. Um, and so there's the... There's also the Twitter account of the, the Economist correspondent for defense. Yeah, Joshi. And there was a report that came out um, that was very in-depth, very well-researched by, I forget what organization this is, um, but a key observation from that report is that um, as Russians moved through towns, local residents began to report on their movements, while Ukrainian special forces and UAVs marked targets for artillery. Although the Russians had heavier artillery, they lacked a good picture of where the dispersed Ukrainian positions were. And, um, yeah, and, and, it, and so the Zelensky advisor said, anti-tank missiles slowed the Russians down, but re what really killed them was our artillery. Um, and so it, it really is, um, you know, if you're a conventional force used to operating under... Um, conventional combined arms doctrine, maneuver warfare, et cetera, et cetera, where it's all about speed, speed, speed. If you have somebody that's landing accurate artillery observation on your concentrated combined armed forces that are attempting to establish a breakthrough, that's a huge weakness for doctrine because these armored forces have to be really combined together as a spearhead. And if you're able to know exactly where they are, you can basically shatter that spearhead of those armored units. Um, so it's hugely disruptive to combined arms forces. I've been thinking about this for about two years now. Um, it's available to see on the GitHub repository. Um, but really, I, I didn't even estimate that it would be quite this effective. It's really staggering. Um, and this isn't you know anybody using my GitHub project per se. It's just people kind of doing their best on the tools they have available with consumer rotary wing aircraft. Uh, the purpose of this project is just to um, enhance the accuracy, reliability, and safety of that process of forward artillery observation with the consumer rotary wing aircraft. Uh, yeah, but it, it really is quite striking. Um, and and you got to imagine for artillery, it's such a hugely destructive force. Using it anywhere near civilians or friendly forces with any kind of errors or just miscommunication or stuff like that um, can cause a really large, tragic loss of human life. Um, there have been claims of indiscriminate shelling of civilian areas. Um, and, you know, that's that's extremely dangerous. You would, you would hope that um, any side in the conflict is being a little bit more discriminatory with its targets um, because really the 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 cost of error is way way too high in this environment um, other uses besides military uses so I did classify this as a dual use technology um, in my repository 
uh, on GitHub. This can be used for all kinds of stuff like wildlife or wildfire detection, um, uh, search and rescue, stuff like that, um, or any other application where you can see the thing, you're looking at it with a rotor wing aircraft, but you don't know where it is. Um, so it's, it's really not very complicated math. Um, we just take sensor data, GPS, barometer for pressure, altitude of that rotary wing aircraft. We use the compass to see which direction it's aiming. Um, and then we use the angle of, de of declination, which I term theta. Um, and that will kind of construct like an imaginary mathematical line shooting straight out from the center of the camera. And then if you have some geographic terrain data, which is easy to find, um, it's publicly available. Um, all you have to do is really trace the terrain data from directly below the aircraft towards that imaginary line. And the point closest to the aircraft where that imaginary line intersects with the real terrain is more likely than not what the target is aiming at. Um, this definitely needs some more testing and maybe some methodology improvements. Um, and then, of course, if you had a laser range finder um, for the aircraft that would remove the need for any terrain data at all, you could just do it, boom, you know the angle, get the exact position with a laser range finder. But those are expensive. Those are like a class whatever laser that are super, super regulated, and most consumers don't get their hands on them. So really what's available now is only that passive opt optical approach to target identification you get with a um, FPV camera on a rotor wing consumer aircraft. Uh, yeah. So next steps for this project. I've kind of been tinkering with this a little bit. I had a breakthrough earlier today. Um, I was finally able to wrangle this Python library and figure out how to use um, the GeoTIFF data format. So, um, so I should explain that a little bit. GeoTIFF is a uncompressed, um, or sorry, a, a lossless compression algorithm for an image. And the very smart people who work with uh, geospatial intelligence software figured out that they could use the TIFF lossless compression image format for storing terrain and topography data. Um, and so that's really nice. It's a very small space on your hard disk, but it can contain a huge amount of information of whatever terrain. Um, and this data set that I was looking at, this is just publicly available. I'm sure militaries have much higher resolution, but like this had a resolution of like 11 meters between data points, which is crazy. Um, you know, that's gotta be close enough for horseshoes and hand grenades. You gotta think. Uh, yeah, so the current status of this project, mainly what I've been working on lately. Yeah, let's see the Python. It's, it's all in Python. Um, the code is super easy to read and super easy to start working with this. The main um, library that it, re it relies on is called GDAL. G-D-A-L, and that's just an open source geospatial um, uh, parsing library. So, uh, yeah, but so this is ready. You can run it. All you have to do is clone the project, um, change directory into the uh, playground directory here, um, and then just run python geotiffplay.py and you get a pretty vivid demonstration. Uh, so for the example um, file, I'm using a geotiff of the city of Rome and the outlying area. Um, it's pretty recognizable. Uh, Rome is the city here in the center. And then this is the river. I think it's the Rubicon. I don't want to get that wrong. Um, but yeah, and, and we can see the data from the GeoTIFF is all there. It's very easy to see. Uh, blue is closest to sea level. Um, and it's really hard to see on my monitor, but there's a little tooltip that appears in the bottom right 
that will tell you the latitude, longitude, and then the elevation value of whatever you're mousing over. Um, and so this is all normal, there's nothing new here, but the application which is new is you're constructing that imaginary line from the rotary wing aircraft and you're using that to aim at a point on the ground and figure out where that point on the ground is through mathematical construction. Um, and so like say if we had an aircraft that was floating here and it had something it was aiming at over here, the algorithm would trace the path under the aircraft until it got close to that constructed line and it was, you know, close enough that it could reasonably be the fix. So it's not precise precise, but the hope is with accurate enough resolution of the terrain data um, and a precise enough that theta angle for what angle the camera's aiming at has to be really, really precise. And I'm not sure if that's available um, for these consumer platforms, but I need to do some research. Basically, if you have enough accuracy with those two numbers, you, know, you should be able to get close enough for horseshoes and hand grenades. Um, so yeah, this is the project. So when you run geotiffplay.py, this is what appears first. You see this nice graphic. Um, and then it tells you some information about the data itself. Um, so I should explain this debug output here. This is just the data, and it's been abbreviated by Python in its printout. Um, X0, X0 is the um, lowest uh, longitude value in the data set. In this case, it's approximately 12.3499. Uh, dx, or um, like in uh, calculus class, the derivative of x um, is just how much the longitude value changes per data point. So if we were to like, this is like 1280 by 720, or 1080 by 720 pixels, or data points in the GeoTIFF file, um, each time you move a pixel, this is how much um, longitude you're actually moving like in real life. So this is the rate of longitude change per data point. Uh, number of calls is the uh, number of items per row, which is counterintuitive, but it's just, you know, if you have 1080 columns, then each row is 1080 long of the data set, the GeoTIFF file. Um, and then X1 is um, the largest longitude value in the data set. Um, and now, very counterintuitively, so something that you have to keep in mind when working with um, uh, geospatial, just like GPS coordinates, is people usually say latitude first. So they say the y-axis first, latitude then longitude. Whereas in most math classrooms, you're used to a point being um, x, y, you know, the, the left and right, then the up and down. Um, and so that's kind of backwards for the convention for latitude, longitude that most people use for navigation. Um, but I attempt to account for that as much as I can um, in how this project is set up, et cetera, et cetera. But kind of a weird quirk of that as well um, is that Y0 is actually the maximum uh, latitude value of the data set. Y1 is the minimum latitude of the data set. Okay, I said that correctly. Um, and then we can also see, so that means that it's decreasing as it goes downwards. Our origin is actually up here at the top left, or sorry, to, uh, bottom left, I guess, because it's, we kind of start things up here at the top left, um, but as you go down, it's actually decreasing, as we can see by the uh, labeled axes here. Um, and then, yeah. This one, it happens that the X resolution and the Y resolution is the same, but that's not always guaranteed. Um, that needs some more testing, evidently. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it's pretty crazy how easy this GDAL library is to use once you figure out all the weird jargon. Um, and it does need some more reliability improvement, but you know, the basic concept is mostly 90% there. So that's what I've got here. 
Um, and then in the code, I recently got this running where um, if you have a latitude and longitude, you can put that in here and then it will give you the an estimate of the elevation of the surrounding data points. Um, so my example, where'd my paper go? Oh no. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so my example, so I use, okay, I already exited the window, but um, there's a point, so latitude 41.8097 and 12.3831, and it's the closest four points to that are these four values for x and y so this is four points in total and then the elevation of the each of these four points is five 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 four and the average of that is 4.75 um which the actual thing that i measured it from was exactly five just doing the little uh tool tip from mousing over the point um and you know that's that's pretty close that's within a quarter of a meter, um, which is, you know, uh, maybe like the length of my forearm, if that. Um, so pretty nice for, um, you know, just some off the wall mathematical calculation. So let me actually show where that value is on the map. I have to restart this program real quick. Um, but the method that implements that is, Uh, get out from lat long. I was kind of dreading writing this function for a while, um, but I finally got it working. And this is really doing most of the heavy lifting for most of the core logic of this program. So all I've got left is to um, uh, kind of use this function in a different function uh, to find where that imaginary constructed line from the center of the camera intersects with the terrain data if you're tracing under um, the aircraft with the direction of travel being the aircraft's azimuth that it's the camera is pointing towards uh yeah so that's that's all done i'm going to import this into a different python file but this is really the heavy lifting for parsing that geotiff file and getting terrain data out of it um, in most kind of usage environments, you have to take the data with you, you know, because you probably won't have access to a internet connection, yada, yada, yada. But um, these GeoTIFF files are small enough that you can reasonably bring all the terrain data you need with you, like on a laptop. Um, yeah. So this is get out from lat long. Um, we, like, import some stuff from... Uh, where we invoke this, we use the, this is from the GDAL framework. I don't fully understand how a lot of this stuff works, but I got most of the code from Stack Overflow up to here. Um, and then, yeah, this is just where we're using GDAL to open the GeoTIFF image file, which contains the terrain data and its pixels. Um, yeah. And then we get X0 dx, dx, dy, y0, dy, dx um, from the geotips uh, like metadata. And then we're ready to go. We're ready to rumble. Um, and then this is where, so this is, these two lines are what makes that window pop up that shows the graph of the geotip image. Um, and then this here, get out from lat long, is the main one that, uh, given a precise um, latitude longitude, gives the closest data points elevation. Um, and that's really the only other function you need. 
So that's that part of that, getting the terrain data from the GeoTIFF file. And then in this other one, get target, I've accomplished the other piece of it. Um, all the data you need for uh, constructing that imaginary mathematical line. So this function is half finished, resolve target. Um, but basically we have the latitude of the aircraft, the longitude of the aircraft, the altitude of the aircraft, which is going to be more precise than the latitude or longitude, usually because there's a barometric sensor for measuring air pressure on most of these aircraft, and that's to help them maintain altitude. Um, so that's going to be a little bit more accurate. Um, and you also get that from GPS data as well, but it's, it's uh, combined with the barometric data for a little bit more accuracy. Um, azimuth is just a way of saying, uh, like on a compass, which direction are you facing? Um, kind of weird if you're used to math class in the unit circle, but in traditional navigation, um, usually people refer to north as zero degrees, uh, east as 90 degrees, south as 180 degrees, and west as 270 degrees. Um, and it increases clockwise. So like on a compass, zero degrees is north, 45 degrees is northeast, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in math class, the way we usually think of it is um, the like east is zero degrees and it increases counterclockwise um, if you've ever taken a trade class. Um, so there is a function kind of way, way down here that will convert the two for use with the Python math libraries. Um, but you know, this it's this stuff is not rocket science. It's really not worth delving into because it, it just converts from one notation to another. Same with degrees versus radians. Most of the math libraries for Python want radians as input, whereas humans usually prefer to deal with degrees for this kind of thing. Um, so it just it just converts the two. You give it degrees in and it will convert it to radians. Uh, yeah, so resolve target. Um, this is assuming that we can get, eventually the goal is to get the azimuth, theta, and x, y, and z directly from one of these aircraft, uh, but we can enter it by, in by hand for now for just getting this, getting a prototype working. Um, yeah, so here we have azimuth and theta, convert them to radians. Um, direction, so we convert it from the azimuth, that like navigation nomenclature where zero degrees is up, and we convert it to math class nomenclature where zero degrees is the positive x-axis. Um, okay, and then so now is just where we have a little bit, but this is very basic trig. So from the azimuth, determine the rate of x and y change per unit travel if we're imagining that imaginary line that's shooting out from the center of that view frustum, the center of the camera. Um, and so delta x is the uh, cosine of that, that angle on the unit circle direction, and cosine is just the, you know, like in math class, the x-axis. Um, and then sine is the y-axis, just like math class with the unit circle. Um, and so that will give you, just if it was traveling one unit straight of distance, one meter, shooting directly out towards the horizon from the aircraft, that will give you the rate of x change and the rate of y change per unit. But we're not dealing with two directions, we're dealing with three directions for 3D. Um, so we also have to calculate the change in altitude per unit travel, um, which in this case is from, comes from the angle of declination of the camera from the horizon, which uh, in, in all the diagrams and all the literature here will just be called theta for simplicity. Um, yeah, and so then uh, math.sine of theta is a positive value, we just multiply it by negative one because we're assuming the, ang the angle is actually from the horizon downward. And so if you're traveling one unit distance down that imaginary line, 
uh, it's actually decreasing the altitude until it intersects with the ground. So that's where delta Z comes from. Delta Z is ready to go right out of the bat. That's accurate. But remember when I said um, this was the unit travel, if it was like going horizontal with the horizon for delta X and delta Y, it turns out we actually have to scale that so that um, the sum of their squares with uh, delta Z adds up to one, whereas these already, delta X squared plus delta Y squared already adds up to one, which is not what we want. We want that imaginal line, imaginary line to be constructed aiming downwards. We don't want it to be constructed aiming level with the horizon because that really wouldn't get us anywhere. Um, so we have a scalar multiple um, just using that uh, angle of declination of theta, the cosine of it instead of the sine this time. Um, and then we just scale delta x and delta y by that amount. And that normalizes, if you've taken a physics class, this is all going to sound very familiar for vectors. But basically all this does is it just figures out the rate of x change, the rate of y change for um, longitude and latitude respectively, and then the change in altitude delta z per unit of travel along that imaginary constructed line of what the camera is aim aiming at. Um, and then there's just a quick debug output in the printout just to show that. Um, and then it, it prints out uh, what the delta x, delta y, delta z is. And this is a different function resolve target in a different file um, called git target.py, which I don't have documentation for yet. But if you just run python git target.py, um, you can just start playing around with this with some uh, fake input values, and it'll start to give you that uh, delta x, delta y, delta z, which is really all you need for um, constructing that line along with the position of the aircraft. Um, so yeah, that's the current state of this project. You know, this is well before pre-alpha. There's not a working prototype up, but I imagine that I'm going to probably complete it within the next few days, because uh, really most of the heavy lifting here is already done. That get out from that long function for actually getting an, an individual point is something that's going to be used hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of time um, in an iterative algorithm for finding that match between that imaginary constructed line and that terrain data. Um, so the rest is not really complicated math. Um, it's just, you know, pretty basic 101 computer science. Um, but the hope is, you know, we're already seeing the usage environment in uh, the current theater of war. Um, these rotary wing aircraft combined with artillery are devastating to traditional combined arms. Um, it really kind of requires a rethinking of what combined arms is and who the players in that are. Um, it makes that those kind of heavy weapons really, really important in that kind of usage environment. Um, and that forward observation, whether it's done by a human observer on the ground, a fixed wing aircraft, rotary wing aircraft, etc., that's becoming more and more important. And it's more important that they can have good coordination with the rear people working on artillery. Um, so back in the days of Napoleonic warfare, um, this is kind of a history spiel, um, but basically the reigning strategy then, the doctrine, uh, was they would get on top of a really, really big hill and they would build super batteries of all these cannons, you know, these physical cannons on the highest hill that had good visibility of the entire area. And then they would just kind of fight there, I guess, because they figured out that having that super battery of heavily, heavily concentrated artillery was devastating for traditional standing armies. And this is before radios and rifles and all that other kind of stuff. Um, with World War I, we really did see artillery becoming... Um, the establishment of doctrine. Um, early on in the war, they really underestimated how much they actually needed for like volume of shells. Um, but it, you know, once they actually ramped up production for those artillery shells, it quickly became a stalemate because without motorized armored vehicles, you know, you can't really maneuver forces fast enough to be able to break through those kind of lines, um, especially when you have somebody um, observing artillery with a field telephone and, and having it rain down on you if you ever try to do anything. 
So that's why trench warfare kind of stuck around. Um, really, right from the opening of World War II with the Blitzkrieg, um, you really saw air cover coming out first to soften a lot of targets and scout and et cetera. And then you had combined arms doctrine where air, infantry, and armor all work together covering each other. And um, the armor really acts as a spearhead to break through lines and the infantry supports armor to allow them to do that. Um, and they move fast enough where generally uh, artillery operators were not able to spot a target, get that information over fast enough and get artillery landing on the right place. Um, because, you know, you didn't really have, um, you didn't have cameras, you didn't have that, you know, television uh, capability. Um, and, and you didn't really have the sensors and stuff like that to know where something was instantaneously connecting that sensor and that shooter. Um, but now we're definitely seeing with this theater in Ukraine, there's more and more reports of artillery being observed by these rotor wing aircraft. And it's easy to, um, to not have enough imagination on how disruptive this can be to existing combined arms doctrine. Uh, just because it's with these cheap, you know, like $200 uh, consumer aircraft. But there's there's a real danger here in underestimating that. Um, because with traditional combined arms doctrine established since the Second World War, you really need that concentration of armor to act as a spearhead. Um, and without that armor, and without that armor having infantry support, you're really not going to get anywhere. Because you need to destroy, like, hard points, fortifications, etc., 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 and be able to suppress while moving, um, be able to suppress uh, enemy units with fire while at the same time moving. Because if you don't move, you're going to get hit by boring old artillery, um, which uh, has kind of almost been forgotten about nowadays. But um, if you have cheap enough and ubiquitous enough aircraft, that can disrupt the current doctrine of combined arms warfare because it can shatter that spearhead. If you have concentrated armored units as they need to be for achieving those kind of breakthroughs, if you're getting accurate and rapid enough um, precision indirect fire, um, those tanks are gonna lose their tracks and they're not gonna go anywhere. Um, and that can stop entire advances. Um, so this is something that I've been thinking about since about 2020. Um, I haven't really been developing this much until past couple of weeks. Um, but, you know, you're already seeing this technique being employed, even if it's not as scientific and mathematical as this. Um, this is really just a project aimed at improving that experience for the forward artillery observer um, in the combat theater um, and making it a little bit safer, a little bit more accurate, and a little bit less room for misjudgment or mismeasurement because, you know, the stakes are astronomically high here. You know, these are um, civilian and uh, combatant lives both at stake here. Um, so I hope this is interesting. This is just kind of the project that I'm working on. Um, if any of this interests you, I highly recommend just go to uh, the GitHub for this, mkrupsack3 slash openathena. Um, this is available on my GitHub profile, which is linked. Um, and just fork the project and start playing around with it, see what you can come up with. Um, once I do finally have that first working prototype available, I am going to announce it as the first pre-alpha version. Um, but from then onwards, I mean, if you have, if you want to run with this thing as far as it goes, feel free to fork it, add whatever kind of modifications you want to it do whatever you want with it. Um, I have licensed it under the Lesser GPL 2.1, um, which basically requires if you use this library and a different piece of code, you have to make your modifications available to your customers, not necessarily to me, but to your customers. Um, I would be very happy if you um, made really awesome changes and put in a pull request. Um, so it can get merged kind of back to this repository. But, you know, once this is up and running, fork it, you know, modify it, make it run better, make it run perfectly, uh, do whatever you want. You know, that's the whole reason of open sourcing stuff. Um, so I hope this is interesting. Uh, do check out Open Athena. 
Uh, it's on my GitHub. Um, and yeah, stay frosty out there. It's crazy right now.